I think it might be a good time to briefly reintroduce um, the event. Welcome again to uh, European Voices Festival, which is a co-production of the Goethe Institute, the Center for the Study of Europe, and the literary magazine Agni at Boston University. We are um, funded by uh, grant support in this case from the European Commission, and we're very grateful for, for that help. So um, in this next session, we're going to hear from Semestin Memedinovich and Emil Alkale, who are going to be in conversation with, with Ainsley Morse. Ainsley is a doctoral student in 20th century Russian poetry at Harvard and holds a master's degree in 20th century Serbian and Yugoslav literature. And Emil, who will be introducing Semestin, um, Emil Alkale is the author of several books, including After Jews and Arabs, Remaking Levantine Culture, an essay collection, Memories of Our Future, and a novel, Islanders. His book-length poem, From the Warring Factions, dedicated to the Bosnian town of Srebrenica, came out in a second edition in 2012, followed by A Little History in 2013. He has translated widely, and during the wars of ex-Yugoslavia, he was an important conduit in the US for materials from Bosnia. He's the founder and general editor of Lost and Found, the CUNY Poetics Document Initiative. So I'll see the floor. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Elizabeth, for inviting us to begin with. Um, I'm going to read from, from <coughs> Warring Factions, and I'll say a few things about it. It's a bit complicated. Um, it's a book-length poem that occupied me from 1993 to, two, to August 2001 um, in <coughs> paying attention and gathering materials. The actual writing of it took place almost in six weeks in the summer of 2001. Um, but it was a preparation of the materials and thinking about it. Um, it's, there are five sections of the book, and they each are a different microclimate of words and references. And um, I'll try to give you some sense of it without that much explanation. But the, the, the dedication is to the Bosnian town of Srebrenica, where there was a massacre of some 7,000 people. Um, but coursing throughout the book are ideas about empire, ideas about the very ephemeral nature of recording memory, uh, particularly through our modern means of film and photograph. Um, and at the bottom are ancient Near Eastern, Native American, and <coughs> current political events of that time, particularly the Gulf War and the Cold War. So those are some of the things that show up, but many other things show up. And book one is called Old Bridge. <coughs> Miro is in the Museum of Modern Art. Miro is in Sarajevo. A famous playwright is on stage at Symphony Space and over the air on NPR. The announcer calls me twice during a break to find out how to pronounce the name Izita. Izita is Miro's wife. They have a dog. It is December 1st, 1993. No pyramids dot the skyline in the seats of power of this crumbling empire. The ghosts of industry eat this old half-city bridge of nevermore again. Eat Glamoch and Grahovo, eat these years. Posters of Saddam whirl and spin. Stealth bombers drop TVs over Baghdad. Books burn in Sarajevo. Babies choke in clouds of evaporated milk. The ghosts of industry dot this landscape. Lo, these many years of construction repairing the irreparable potholes, the gaping erosion of industrial repetition, this tarred and feathered landscape, this tarred and feathered history. My neighbor found an arrowhead in his backyard, 385 10th Street, Brooklyn. 
Waking up in a sweat, I found the old bridge hanging from my neck and the whole town of Pochito in the pocket of my jacket draped over a chair in the shadow of a pot filled with rosemary and lavender. Book two is called No Place Not Rome. <clears throat> Race, the cold scent, this urge, this rough fell, the map, meander through dust in this vein like an ace in the hole, an ache in the hole. The eyes rave, sewn in the soft web like gout, nickel and dime. Oh me, oh my, the other sons, the tot, oh soft us, owned and raced and rough and oh so cold. In this our day of darkness, see what beyond the scattered leaves the Sibyl said. No time to gape at games, the place that once was across the waters, the shore that lie beyond, the blurry lines going away like things spent to live in the very glint of what little might have been paradise. Such blood and dreams, there don't seem to be any civilians. Face, about face, I don't care about the imperial mouthpiece. Doesn't need any face to fight his war. I don't read about that stuff in the line of duty, in the line of destiny, without losing control to speculate about what may or may not be included in a plan that might or might not be implemented is inappropriate in this secret room, drawing now if to sympathize or if to despise this empire of dreams, dreaming of empire, and blazing fields in the fearful hearts of such good people, heaping much more on their plates than they can eat. These are the innocents. Over and over again, they claim they have no one to talk to. Rested and resolute, calm and resigned, determined and vigilant, steady and strong. A life which does not need war would go up used like destiny to always learn the passion for the justice, things not sufficiently heroic, buildings taken out on the way to work, collapsing in this bitter inheritance of caliber and alchemy this heaving breast of sleep and horn and ivory. They should be soaking in oil. Olives? Birds? A line drawn in the sand, a line to arrive. This is no country battle, my brother, my seemingness. Of what dead comrade did the priestess speak? What body did she mean for them to bury? The capital, the capital, this is the Apian way. Speed up the process by showing your empress this page. Don't be too stubborn to ever show a sign. Make like Nero in Quo Vadis shorts, eight fiery patterns blazing in color. Poor toga-clad Nero never knew the smart comfort of these full-cut rayon boxers. He don't know what he missed, the small voice of Cleopatra whispering to Liz across the centuries. You really can rule the world. Get a barge. Roll yourself up into a magic carpet and have it sent to so many fascinating possibilities, parallels in life of the two girls. Spooky, both queens accused of stealing husband from nice wife. Liz replies, what am I supposed to do? Ask him to go back? Cleo would have done the same in Cinemascope, the modern miracle you can see without glasses, without sympathy, without tyranny, without oil, the orgies, the triumphs, the palaces, the costumes, the pomp, sails on ship of state, as you blaze your way through the gulf, the brush grass and the sand, the trench and the cities of salt, liken my weeping eye to a casting of the stones, to a bewildering darkness on fire with hunger, the tent marks worn away and left to the wild, uncovered, like the script of faded spools disintegrating, reels wound in spirals of dust as forms begin to reappear at the limits of weariness, traveling on a pillow of thick oil or black pitch before the wheel of war turns down the departing riders like the flat back of a shield no one dares cross when the chameleons struck by heat begin to reel and twist their head, the camels like boats floating down the desert of the Tigris. So many Romes to go, oh, Rome of Scots and Rome of Brits, of Slavs and Spics, Jew Rome, Arab Rome, Rome Afrique, no can go home no more, Rome, oh Rome.
each and all the words and deeds, to work hard, to sustain and abstain, to wish with all my faculties that the social wealth would belong as it was the fruit of the work of all. I know that, I see that, I tell that to everybody. Orpheus too was afraid. It was a night without moon, I remember. I will write something, a meditation perhaps, and name it a little knowledge of the past. This is from the third section, which is called Migration, Hegira. And this third section is the only section that specifically references the events uh, in Srebrenica. But the people, the procession regal by origin and birth you are of the land of leaving the unexpected, owing no one anything but the people in the fall when the hunter shoots the bear and its blood turns the leaves red. The shields retreat, migrate, the battle lines common, the wood wherein we walk, this division we have not always known, this plenty, journeying, journeying in your old age through every risk as the slaves march on to see the sight of the great old empire, unsuspected, dying, well-beloved, saying to the people, do not weep for me, this is not my true country. This muddy water, the curved line, a river valley circle within a circle might mean a very brave joined to a dwelling but separated, moving secretly to the east, not wasting any time, this time beyond the great tide waters, leaving friends, leaving family, leaving hearts upon the ground. The map the voyage made to explain my detours, to keep them alive, to resist the scheme, like places desolate of old in the lowest parts of the earth, like the cities that are not inhabited to the people of old time. Your borders are in the heart of the seas, on the morning star and the evening star, on the transit and the hood, on the ornament, on the union, on the rebellion and the shrillness that will never cease to trouble us, on the western point of this island, with its variety of ochres of different colors with which the inhabitants paint their houses against autumn, assembling with weapons, with symbols for dwelling with four houses, with our finest always dead, with the ravens that brought the prophet bread, dust where lies the passage strewn with yellow leaves, the horses that pass the leaves tangled in their manes, having learned, so to speak, the words almond, uncanny, evasive, the stars not yours, the candles buried beneath these waters of the door to the setting sun, beneath all you have seen on earth and all you can see now, the jaws, the knees, the teeth buried in the mud. Here you will find your relatives and your glory laid waste, every precious stone that was your covering, the ruby, the chrysolite, and the diamond, the emerald, the jade, the sapphire, the turquoise, the beryl, and the gold, the beads and braids and coal black hair, up and down in the midst of the stones of fire, coming from the east head first like arrows flying, all the fish of the rivers fallen upon the open fields, neither brought together nor gathered like ashes scattered upon the earth, blood in the streets and the wounded falling in heaps, a king of kings from the north with horses and with chariots and with horsemen shall destroy your walls and break down your towers and make you like a bare rock as the sea causes waves to come up like a place for the spreading of the nets in the middle of the sea, and you will search for the remains of your sons and daughters left in the fields like dust in the midst of abundant waters. The sun and moon in their reckoning, the stars and trees bowed low, the kernel in the grain and the fragrant herb, the pear and plum trees so close to the window, like wool dyed and carded, like scattered moths now left to the wild, like inscriptions worn thin on flattened stones, like tamarisks and boulders in the shimmering haze. Love of the ruins inflames not my heart, but the love of those who once inhabited them. Not so much the house, but the roses, they tear me apart. Have you considered the water you drink, the fire you kindle, 
the birds above spreading their wings and closing them as if they were the stumps of fallen trees. His hand on my shoulder, still trembling. An utter extinction of the domestic affections, the judicial murder of the advocates of liberty, the treachery and barbarity of hired soldiers. Say hello to Ibrahim, left behind the prism of moral equivalency. Engage the column in accordance with agreed procedures, holding all the cards, a consensus absent, lacking a strategy, burdened by an unclear mandate, forced to chart its own course, a light option without formed units, a light option with formed units, a heavy option, lift and strike, building on the process in order to promote symbolic deterrence, participate in the delivery, enable force multiplying characteristics, monitor significant blind spots, take stock, and in the absence of fundamental consent, level the killing field and execute the mandate. In some cases, the victims were made to dig their own graves. In others, they were shot while standing in them. It appears that over the course of the next several months, the bodies were taken out of the initial mass graves and reburied in 33 different secondary sites. One survivor later realized that he was walking on blood. Suddenly, like shapes of living stone clothed in the light of dreams, I tore the veil, the shrouds which wrap the world, the frost of death, the flood of tyranny, a paradise of flowers within which the poor heart loves to keep the earnings of its toil, a common home, stains of inevitable crime, pride built upon oblivion to rule the ages that survive our remains, violence and wrong, an unreturning stream, the grief of many graves, snow and rain on lifeless things. This is not faith or law, opinion more frail or life poison in its wells that delights in ruin. As endless armies wind in sad procession, the earth springs like an eagle, even as the winds of autumn scatter gold in the dying flame. We learn to steep the bread of slavery in tears of woe. These faded eyes have survived a ruin wide and deep, which can no longer borrow from chance or change what will come within the homeless future, that gold should lose its power and thrones their glory that love which none may bind be free to fill the world like light whose will has power when all beside is gone, faint accents far and lost to sense of outward things, some word which none here can gather, yet the world has seen a type of peace, some sweet and moving scene returning to feed on us as worms devour those years, come and gone like the ship which bears me in this, the winter of the world. <clears throat> uh, okay. And now I'll just finish with some uh, from section four, which is called Borrowed Time. Um, and Borrowed Time has two quotes. Um, Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand. Phyllis Wheatley, 1768. It is most unpleasant work to steal bones from a grave, but what is the use? Someone has to do it. Franz Boas, June 6, 1888. This vast machine, its transient sweetness, expectant, the acts recovered when action ceases and ideas range in due order. We see the long forgotten years departed, all their cunning, all their strength, all their force more guarded. The owl seeks the caves of night in sadness, the unbounded regions of the mind, the land of errors which wanton tyranny with lawless hand had made of wrongs and grievance unredressed till nature leave the earth behind, and place itself would rise and o'erspread the lands beneath, and learn to imitate her language there. Bright jewel, final wreck, fatal scepter I strive to comprehend. 
the shift from fresh air to our political atmosphere. Not a grant of rights to, but a grant of rights from, a reservation of those not granted. Here were the flowers, prairies by the sea, the music as of old set like jewels in the green expanse. Something like soul that you are witness to, that you remember by experience, by surfaces, some great, great wound in the whole body, so unwieldy, so completely irretrievable, no one dares operate. The ghost of the pain is the circle of wild horses. Let them feed on this ground observant of these heavenly lights like an unaccustomed ghost that starts surprised to stumble over graves, the names of people once numerous. Do not feel badly because you have lost sight of this daylight. No matter how hard I try, nothing happens today to you alone. Those who have reached the place where death stands waiting have not pointed out a way to circumvent it. I myself grieve when I look back there into the past. It is enough to make anyone ponder. Now here at last we are ready to end this. When you start to leave you must not think back with regret. You always return, garment of brightness, wilderness in the midst of plenty. Farewell bright moment, lingering sun. This heart will never awaken. Thank you. Semezdin uh, Mehmedinovich, and uh, just to say a few things about how we didn't meet for many years, uh, but knew of each other uh, while he was living in Sarajevo and I was in New York, um, translating uh, a variety of things, mainly very urgent things that were coming uh, during the siege, and. Uh, at the same time, I was always asking people, who, you know, who are the poets? What is being written? What, what, what kinds of things are, are happening? And then I started to get from Josip Osti in, in Slovenia, uh, what was called the Biblioteca ABC, Exil ABC, and this was A, Sarajevo Blues. Um, and these were, as you can see, very economical editions. Uh, created in wartime conditions. And um, my feeling was when I began to think about translating people from that situation was that I, I couldn't make that decision myself. I had to collectively ask people what they thought. I didn't want to just swoop in and say, oh, I like this, or this is good, or this should be translated. So I began to ask people I, when I got this. I said, if I translate this, how would you feel about it? Universally, everybody said, that's what we feel, please go ahead. So I started translating uh, Semesdin's work, and I feel very much like the conversation that Laszlo and George had is the conversation that we have because I almost feel responsible for Semesdin being in America, and I've abandoned him because I haven't been translating him for a while, and he is no longer the person who wrote these books, um, and it's a very difficult position to be in. So, uh, that we may rectify that with a new manuscript that he recently showed me, and hopefully that will be the case, so he, his, his selves can merge into the present, uh, or more into the present. So, without further ado, I'll welcome Semesdin Mehmedinovich. Thing. Because I thought after Laszlo, everybody will escape from this place. Um, okay, I'll read a uh, few poems from Sarajevo Blues.
corpse. <clears throat> we slow down at the bridge to watch some dog steal a corpse apart by the river, and then we went on. Nothing in me has changed. I heard the crunch of snow on the tires like teeth biting into an apple and felt the wild desire to laugh at you because you call this place hell and you flee from here convinced that death outside Sarajevo does not exist. Loss. He keeps ringing until I get up and when he comes in, he looks at the paper on the table. No inspiration, my father asks. Look, he says, the lake is so frozen that heavy trucks can go over it if they have a chains on their winter tires. He keeps talking until I'm convinced the world can be looked at from another perspective. And I see people walking across the lake, each one with a fish hook in their mouth. I ask myself, which one of us will die first? But only after he took off his jacket to show two bites of a clothespin on the shoulders of his white shirt. August 1989. The synagogue at night. Rain outside. I'm already making coffee for the third time. An old poet dozes off on the floor, covered in a flag. A poor old poet curled up like a fetus, wrapped up in the state flag, sleeping. Ali Pakovac. <clears throat> Ali Pakovac is a graveyard in Sarajevo old graveyard from <clears throat> 17th century, beautiful, if you can say that for, for graveyard, yeah. Ali Bakovac. At the very eastern edge of Sarajevo, a boy loaded down with an armful of roses. It's Byram and he, the little merchant, is going to the graveyard loaded with the roses. Loaded with a hundred coarse roses, like a grave on the day of its digging, like a grave on the day of its digging, the boy is climbing Alevakovat. Stranger. Once I too will depart alone into the darkness of the grave. On Alifakovac or another hill, the city I knew everyone in. And now only two or three remain. And only night alone I look out from the past on the city's darkness from someone else's home. I Stranger, I a stranger. Deserter. Only then, not before you have coffee on the train station. The dispatcher tapping the wheels of the locomotive with the hammer. The paper tucked under your arm. Leaving the city in peace, you'll never be true to yourself anywhere unless your very life is the only truth, unless the empty air calls itself freedom, unless you are a deserter with an uneasy consciousness, unless you are Peter the Kid. Spirituality. In the evening we wait for the moment forms open. The sky is still in darkness from the radiance of earthly things. And then the building become like models blackened by the shadow of their surfaces. And the torrid sky appears as the moon begins to shine amidst the wall. 
that instant everything. And my son, looking out the window, cast a divine smile on the domesticated power of the elements. Back then, today I remember a Greek poet six feet tall. We sat in Europe, the Pinko restaurant and talked. He was sentenced to death once and stayed up till morning waiting for the firing squad. A lot of time has passed since then. Now he's Manolis Anagnostakis, smoking strong Greek cigarettes with white filters and begging off hard liquor. I have the feeling that he's renounced politics. And then we heard an explosion from the sidewalk, and the six feet tall body leaned over the window like an arch. Someone threw a firecracker into the container, which lit some computer paper thrown in from the bank across the street on fire. And I thought, not again in Sarajevo. The words, he said, sounded like such a crook. All right, I thought. Anyone who's looked death in the eyes has the right to play around with, with it a little. I was young then, and I didn't know that death is something a lot more common than it seemed. So plain that anything you say about it sounds trite. At the edge of town, at the edge of town, you can see a truck left over from the last war getting smaller down between the poplars. A prisoner with cramps in his beard is pulled out of a military jeep, piled up in the warehouse plank by plank, as neat as a sun. At the very edge of town, you can see a biker at full tilt grab at the roof of a long shack with a vulcanizer written across it, and many other images rich in madness to any objective celestial gaze, like the roofs of the houses by the airport painted in red and white checkboard squares. Mm -hmm. No man's land. For over a month now, over where the dividing line is, the bodies of the dead lie. You can get close to them. You can't get close to them. The white UN transporters don't go there to pick them up. The unburied lie, and their souls wander with the city's crows. A marcher's resting place. A body just about to be buried. I see a soldier on his knees, still a kid. His rifle rests in his lap. You can hear the guttural murmur of a rabbit. Sorrow gathers in cycles under the eyes. The men pass their open palms across their faces. As the rites continue, I feel the presence of God in everything. When this is over, I will take a pen and make a list of my sins. Now, everything in me resists death. As my tongue passes over my teeth, I can sense the taste of a woman's lipstick. No one is crying. I keep quiet. A, ju a cat jumps across the shadow of a mineral. Lilies. One. Dream. I'm going down the steps toward the old city. As I cautiously head over to the north side of town, I feel some warmth at the back of my head. 
I move ahead carefully so I don't trample the flowers growing on every step. The shell have gauged out the level surfaces of the steps and with the rainwater, dirt was gathered in the hollowed out cavities. I make sure to stand only at the edge so I don't plunge into the abyss or squash the weak, pale flowers, the sickly flowers. Two, which Fassbinder film was that thing? One armed man goes into a florist and asks, which flower shows that the days are passing? And the florist says, white lilies, Laurie Anderson. Kids, S, Harun, come on, get into the house. It's grenading outside. War. War and nothing is going on. I go into town to beg for cigarettes. I've always known your scent, but you've never been closer. Sometimes when it's cold in the morning, you put my underwear on by mistake. In 10 years, we haven't been together as much as we have these five months. Now, you've got my sweater on all day. Your joy at the packets of humanitarian aid makes me happy and sad at the same time. And I ask myself, where on earth do you find us coffee every day? There isn't a single pane of glass left in our windows, and there is just no way to get rid of lagging flies. Bates. He was killed January 17, 1994. Every day from then on, he's been dead. He's dead today too. It's Friday, February 24, 1995. Every day I have a transcendental experience. When I go to the bathroom at night, I notice a shadow rising in the mirror over my left shoulder. It isn't mine. I turn and what do I, do I see? My eyes open in sleep. A raven has landed on my table and in a human voice says, cherries will be ripe in Sarajevo the 17th of May. I heard and I'm waiting. I have a few poems from a book, Nine Alexandrias, actually from a poem called Nine Alexandrias, written in a week after September 11th, doing my trip by train from uh, east to west coast. Nine Alexandrias. Maybe that isn't all of them, but the way I figure it, there are at least nine cities in America called Alexandria. Carto cartography of the new had to be based on the principle of tracing the old world through an ocean of indigo. The only thing that makes my trip across country imaginable is this. Going from one Alexandria to another, I can't help but get to the same city. And only by knowing for sure that the world is still in one piece can I imagine moving from one American Alexandria to another on the same Egyptian dock. Functions of the heart. On his American tour, the smiling cardiologist from New Zealand explained his discovery about the human heart producing a type of hormone we knew nothing about till now. As he explains the consequences of his discovery, he returns the greeting of the workers on the truck waving at the train from under their yellow helmets, and the woman, too, waving from her deck. It's only in his company that I notice this peculiar, almost uniquely railway ritual. 
the people who stay wave at the train. The smiling cardiologist knows that greetings are meant for him and that such continental isolation must have originated in the functions the heart abandoned. Moorish mm -hmm. Fountain. I was standing in the courtyard at the train station in LA looking at the water in the Moorish Fountain when a homeless guy asked me if I could watch his dog before he just went off someplace on his way. No one had ever asked me to look after a dog before, at least not like that. Looking after the dog in front of the Moorish Fountain, I had no idea what I'd do with him if the homeless guy didn't come back. And I write of my discomfort as inexperience. Looking after a homeless dog in and of itself seems absurd like anything I suppose you try the first time. Hotel room. In the hotel called the Royal pa Palace for some reason. Okay. In the hotel called the Royal Palace for some reason. The door to the room across the hall is always open. Calmly lying on the sheet, breath betrays a body there. I think he's dying, and he knows it. From the, the dark room, you can hear the cheerful sound of a kid you can't see. And that makes you think it can be a real voice, but sounds the dying here before they go, like an utterance, like an utterance in the very own first attempt of at language. I don't know why hotel rooms seem so endless to the point I live with no memory. Two days and three nights I travel from the east to the west coast and in my weariness I refuse to believe the continent is any smaller than this hotel room. For the sorrow of a continent, going from one American coast to another, I saw lonely people, sorrowful and angry. I saw good people, and even those transmitted the only warmth that they had to the ring on their finger. And I believe I preserved the sorrowful expression within me for the sorrow of a continent, just like a train preserves the memory of a galleon, since every message reaches me across my feet. What I mean is I'm a political emigre every trip I take, always on the ground trading water. I feel like uh, I shouldn't be here and that I'm standing on the planet diagonally like those kids drawn on greetings card put out by UNICEF. And I will read just a few more poems from uh, Fragments from a poem, this door is not an exit. In the garden of a restaurant, a reddish colored cat stares at the tiny creatures in the leaves. Everything is so natural that it's familiar. We sit around the cast iron table like a real family on an outing. And I think of my father. He was a miner in a coal mine. And I think of my father's father, who was a miner in a salt mine. I think of a black and white family photo from a time that makes me feel something like sorrow and not sorrow. Something from the glint of whose eyes only massive solar panels could make migrate into the language of poetry. I never had a house of my own, nor have I ever ceased imagining it. If I could have my pick, I point out, that's what my house would look like. But that's a funeral home, she said. And it's true, the kids use bright colors to paint motif of burial and death on the northern facade of the building. And we drive on listlessly, the wind filling plastic bags, 
on the desolate treetops down the whole length of Rhode Island Avenue. Okay? And this one because it's dedicated to our wheel. The sun went down right to the gas pumps. They lost itself in the clouds. I'm standing on Telegraph Avenue and looking up. Chesla Milos lives on the hill and because of him I think of my room in Sarajevo and I think of that room's bookish utopia. I had wanted to show the symbol of Islam in the light of so-called Western metaphysics. And I wanted to renew the forgotten notion of Jesus, the boy wonder, but it all ends in poor desire. As I'm standing on Telegraph Avenue now, I feel like I'm ready because there's nothing else I want to possess. Thank you. I, I would just have a couple of questions for Amiel and Semezdin, and then uh, I'm sure you all have more. Um, uh, I'll start off with two. Um, one question I like to ask other translators, being one myself and writer, uh, is about the two-way street of working with a living writer, and um, if you both translate and write. And so I would love to hear from both of you about um, whether you feel you have uh, influenced each other, whether what you think about uh, the work that Amiel has done, um, and so on. And then actually continuing uh, something that came up when George and Laszlo were speaking about the different quality of irony in Hungarian. And um, as someone who has spent a lot of time in former Yugoslavia and with close friends from there, I feel uh, very affected by a very specific Yugoslav irony or sense of irony and so I would also love to hear from both of you about how especially since you have since moved to the US um, and are writing on American themes how that translates well uh, you know living in the US I'm totally dependent on translations which means of Okay, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and because of that, last time I have a real reading, it's uh, more than 10 years ago. Because you know, you can't read all time same things, okay? Amiel actually refused to, to translate, <laughs> okay? And there was a son, you know, I tried to find translators, but I didn't know why, and I refused to do this. And the, from one point, I started to think about my books, which means in Basque. And the truth is, at the beginning, I have a problem, you know, because, you know, you, you are in a new environment, and in, you know, there is a new language, but you stay, I'm, I stayed in the, in the Basque, right in Basque. You know, I stopped writing, because, you know, it, there was some kind of frustration But from one point, a point, as I said, you know, I start writing my books, you know, and I do this now, you know, like every year, one, one book, and, and I know one day somebody will come and translate all this, and I don't think about this, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, but at the beginning, you know, when Sarajevo Booth was published, you know, I have a lot of invitations for reading syndrome, I go around and, uh, and I read uh, translations. I read English, and now I read English. You know, like it's, it's mine, but it's not. It's Samuel's work, okay? And, uh, 
And in, it happened in Europe. I was in Berlin um, reading in 2003. Okay. Now I, I have to choose on which kind of language, you know. Which means I have to read my work or Amil work, you know. And for years, I, I, you know, I was without contact with my work, okay? And I was on the edge to choose Amil's work, actually. And I saw, you know, this is a real problem, okay? It's a real problem. There is some um, identity drama there. But um, Amil, uh, during the process of translating uh, Nine Alexandrias, says, you know, it was uh, very simple for me to translate. It was like sipping uh, water from one glass to another. And there is something in this, you know, the uh, similarity between um, original, Basmian original and English translations, especially in Sarajevo Road, is a huge, you know, part that I read. They are, you know, they are in the Basmian. You know, it is, it happens sometimes. It happens, you know, there is a, you know, that famous frost sentence that poetry is something that we use in translations. I, I don't think it's true. It's sketchy, it's nice, well, but it's not true. You know, it's a, you know as a poet, I learn, you know, in my 70s and 80s, I learned mostly from uh, translations. And not just translations, but let's say, my connection with American literature, with American poetry, coming from a German poetry, because, you know, influence of American literature on the German literature, uh, 60s and 70s, especially poets in the um, so-called new sentiment movement in uh, Rolf Dieter Brinkmann, Delius, and that. They are really influenced by American um, poetry, New York School, indeed. Okay. And, uh, and, you know, they influence me because that's my first connection with, uh, with uh, you know, let's say, big generation of poetry. And uh, translations is, uh, is uh, really important, really important, and sometimes can be better, you know, than original. Do you feel like the Alexandria poems in some ways involve translation on your part, even as you were writing them in, in Bosnian? Is that when um, you're talking about the glasses as well? No, we are talking about Daniel's sentence. Amil uh -huh. said, said that he just, you know, it was, mm -hmm. uh, for him it was uh, really simple to translate, you know, because, you know, he, uh, to find the equivalent in a, in a language was easy for him. But it's not just a question of language. You know, it's uh, it's more than that. You know, Amil and we we, we share some uh, same cultural backgrounds. You know, uh, her interest, uh, his interest in uh, in uh, literature is similar like mine. Not, not just that. You know, we we have a similar interest in the art, in the, in the movies, you know, or, or music. Okay, and uh, you know, like this small allusions, you know, in the inner language, small details in the language, sometimes, you know, can be recognized just from somebody who is from that cultural background. And we, and we really share, you know, like, really similar. But it helped a lot, and also his part. In meantime, I'm uh, really scared, I'm sorry, I'm really scared when we talk about translations. I have a, a book in German, you know, published, in it was a disaster. And uh, usually when they ask me to publish something around it, you know, I refuse because, you know, they, they, you know, I don't know who is a translator. I don't know, you know, publishing house. And I feel better if I'm not published than if I published, okay? Now I publish, let's say, in, 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 uh, in Budapest, book like last week, but just because I know translator, he's a poet, you know, he's from World of the Week, you know, we have a similar interest. I believe in his, you know, 
contradiction of the language. But it can be a little disaster. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, <clears throat> just to, specifically in terms of translation, Samazdin's language is incredibly precise. It's remarkably precise. So I did have that feeling of just you know, pouring something from one glass into another. But, you know, I think um, in the United States, at least, I think there people are trans, tran, translation. The hardest thing about translation is to translate the what you don't understand, you know, and what you what you what a reader, you know, to create enough space for a reader where you're not over interpreting something and you're allowing it to, and partially, some as in the precision of his language allows that, and so the whole poem rests on the syntax. It has to it has to arrive at the end in a very particular way because of the logic of its of its imagery and of its and of its statement. Um, but what I found happening in a, a very similar, kind of in reverse to what Samezin was talking about, is that I found my own involvement in translation, particularly with Samezin's, I wasn't completely unaware of it until I was doing some readings with an old friend, Benjamin Hollander, who, who read the poem Dates that Samezin read, and then, you know, and then Benjamin said, well, look at how you're starting from the Warring Factions. You're starting with his dates. Doesn't that have any relationship? I said, I never really thought of that. I, I absolutely didn't think of that. And what I found in a similar way when you said you stopped, you know, you stopped writing, I found myself translating myself in some way um, in which I was taking, in which I was trying to retrieve various stages of myself and my writing and bring it into a place that would be comprehensible to me at the present or useful at the present. And it was a kind of translation. It was a kind of constant translation. And this book particularly left me in a kind of dead end because the method is very radical and I really couldn't do anything after this. It just kind of dead ended um, because it, 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 it is quite a radical method that I used. So. You know, it's not always, these things that we do are not always, um, do not always lead to good ends, you know, they, they can lead to very, to very mysterious and difficult dead ends in some ways, you know, that force you to confront form and your own, um, you know, your own initiative. Why are you writing at all? You know, what is driving you at all to this? To this act, um, and and so it's yeah. I think I mean, in particularly in our, um, we had those kind of things. Mm -hmm. I think that happened partially because of the circumstances, and partially because of, as Samazin said, the similarities in sensibility and 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 approach. Um, well, it strikes me. I guess the obvious, an obvious connection between your Warring Factions book and the Sarajevo Blues book is um, basically the, the elegy, right? I mean, these are, these are, these are uh, memorials, especially um, the English Sarajevo Blues since it came out after the end of the war. Um, and yet, could, well, you, could no, you speak just, to that? I, I would also just say to me, you know, my, my translations have been very much also a mode of challenge to American writers who, and I want to reach them at a place, I want to reach them at a place that is several notches below the, you know, the consumption model, several notches below the object consumption model of translations that are kind of like, you know, cherries in December, where, oh, we ought to have some Iranian literature, we ought to now have some literature from the Gulf, or we ought to have this, or we ought to have that, and more of a necessity, of a necessity. I mean, that's why the question begins, you know, this is a riddle here, it's December 1st, 1993. Okay, well, where were you? What were you thinking about? How would you place yourself in relation to that date? And so my translations have really been 
how would you place yourself in relation to the form that is emerging from the urgency of that situation? How can you speak to that or relate to that? And that has to do with who the books are published with and what kind of a reader will encounter that and how it might affect thinking about their own work. Yeah, this, uh, this connects for me nicely with what we were just hearing uh, after the play about the audiences mm -hmm. in North America versus Germany. And uh, I was thinking that uh, there is also the didactic moment, right? The, the moment where, um, okay, maybe North American audiences are always wanting to be explained. And this is something I think about a lot, translating into English. Um, but what if you don't explain? And what if you leave people hanging? And I, and I was hoping to actually ask you about this, Samezdin, um, uh, with your American book and with other work that you have written since, since living here. Um, do you feel like that resonates with you, a challenge? Well, you know, I, I, you know, I have, um, I have two workers here. I mean, already said, but with translations, it's really important. You know, selections are really important. You know, the, the, in the United States, you know, publishing houses don't publish a lot of uh, literature in translations. And, and when, it's small number that it's important. What is it published? In a way, you know, I have asked myself, for what reason I'm published? Because I know some important writers, they are not published. Okay. And, uh, and today, you know, listening, uh, reading a uh, uh, Hungarian novelist, I talked about one really important Hungarian novelist from 20th century. His uh, name was uh, Sándor Marai. And he was a guy <coughs> who moved from, uh, as an established writer, he moved from uh, Budapest uh, in, I think, in 48, and spent some time in Italy. And from Italy, he moved in the United States which means half of his life, because he killed himself in, 19, uh, in 89, half of his life he spent in, in America. And during his life, nobody knows about him as a writer, because he, nobody published his novels. Um, after his death, you know, like 10, 20 years after his death, there is some books published, his books, novels. And in the same time, what is a, what I thought uh, is important from his uh, opus is what he wrote in America, because he had uh, like 46 books. And he wrote, all his life he wrote a diary. And there was a that, partially the diary was published here, but you know, connected with the uh, 40s and, and Soviet, Soviet uh, rule in, in Budapest. And, uh, but he is not, you know, published yet his diary from the uh, 80s. And in this diary, in this part of the diary, he wrote about America. And it was just amazing. There was a, uh, you know, he's 80 something year old, alone, and he decided to kill himself. Okay, and in diary he described how he, he's going to store to buy a gun. Okay, and on a f four pages he described how he's going in a, a police facility outside uh, of San Diego to learn how to use a gun. Okay, at the same time he explained, you know, what um, gun is in American culture, what gun represents in American mm -hmm. culture. He explained, you know, behavior, all these people, retired policemen, people coming to learn how to use a gun. And, make, and he makes statistics about suicide because that's important for him, okay? And he's talking about reason why people, most people coming to, to learn. And these are, you know, old people like him at this facility 
gun, and he used this gun to kill himself at the end. Okay, uh, pages like this in this diary exist, and it's not translated here. You know, but that part of of his literature, let's say literature, connected with the United States, it's unknown for for American readers. In same time, American readers now they have a you know, few of his novels, they know something. But can you imagine what will be his influence if he's published in the 50s? Mm -hmm. yeah. Which means, you know, selection is uh, really important. When I came to the United States of America, there was no publishers to publish translations. You know, they, there's no something like this. Now there is some publishers they published. And I think uh, now it's really different, and it's going in a different way. You know, uh, like decade ago, there was a Zebel as a as a as a trend in the U.S. You know, like German writer as a, you know modern writer in the United States. After him, there was a Bolag. Okay. Uh, after Bolani, there is uh, Krasna Horka. Krasna Horka is an old star. And things like that. Let's say, in, I don't remember that in the 90s or in the 80s. Maybe before it happened with Borges, and, and that small group of Latin American writers. Maybe we should have some questions from the audience now, I think. <laughs> At least some of my, <clears throat> the whole Marais story is very, very interesting, yes. Um, partly the way he came to public attention um, and then which parts of his work were chosen. A number of his works are still being published in Hungarian. The reason, uh, the reason why some authors are interesting at some times and other authors are, interested, are interesting at other times um, is itself quite, quite a fascinating matter. I think there are periods, A, that there are the politically important writers, so I can think of a whole lot of what I think was Cold War literature, yes? Um, so people were interested in them because they were politically important. And then there is this other thing in which um, I'd be curious to know your opinion, so I mustn't turn it into a statement, I'm turning it back into a question. Um, why is it that at certain times certain people are interesting? In England, for example, um, about 20 years ago, we had a lot of Ovid. Then we had a lot of Dante. Uh, now we have a lot of Rilke. And the interesting thing is why these things happen, whether there are particular needs or um, interests um, that these people address in some way. I suspect with Mare mm -hmm. that the publishers, it's not who are his chief publishers in the US, that um, they think, well, maybe the big kind of fuss is now over and who's going to be even, who's going to be interested in Mare, it becomes a slightly different matter from the commercial matter that it became in the first place. So anyway, my question is whether there are certain reasons beyond immediately literary value, clearly because there's a lot, as you said, which is of great literary value, which may not be being translated, as to what is it that uh, gives that specific interest? Actually, I, I don't have an answer. It's because so I, I want to think that there is a reason behind it. I want to think it, it will help. But I think it's uh, coincidental. It just happened because somebody show up and says, OK, I know one amazing Hungarian novelist. I read this novelist last night in uh, Albania. OK? And I can believe that it, this doesn't translate it into English. OK? And because that voice is influential, okay, somebody show up and said, okay, show me this Hungarian novelist. And it happened 
that way. I don't believe, you know, like there's a, there's a, of I course think, there is. I, I think there's a. I think there are many, there are many, many different, many many different reasons. There's one, as Samezdin said, which is somebody shows up and does it, and I think that's true for smaller languages and smaller countries where there's a little bit more. <coughs> Um, you know, working in American English, I, I'm always conscious of the fact that, you know, American English is also a very blunt instrument if it's being delivered by the IMF or it's being delivered by the NSA or some other entity, it, it's a very blunt instrument. And so part of the task, my task as a translator is to figure out how to, you know, both reveal the bluntness of that instrument but change it change its possible application. And so I think there are many different ways. I think there's very systematically related to political alliances and economic, um, you know, almost outsourcing questions, you know, certain things and, and obviously wars that are, that are related to a country's foreign policy. The main reason why there is some interest in Arabic literature at this point has to do with the coming to fruition of decades of active people who were translating completely on the margins, and then a war happens, a couple of wars happen, and you have an opening in which the material can, can find some, some, some place. You have that. You also have, um, as George said, you know, you have these cyclical, cyclical Dante's, cyclical Ovid, cyclical, Rilke's, et cetera, where they keep showing up for one reason or another. Um, those, you know, I'm not quite sure how that happens. I, I have some ideas, but, um, so I think there are many, many different reasons, but um, part, of, part of the, in the US, there's, there's nothing in any sense that's systematic. I mean, I remember, for instance, in Sarajevo, there was a publishing house called Svetlost, which was uh, Ivan Lovrenovich was the editor in chief, and they had a theory, a literary theory uh, series that systematically translated everything that needed to be translated. So, I mean, of grammatology by Derrida came out first in came out years before in Sarajevo than in English, for instance. Uh, it just translated whatever was deemed to be, you know, of that. Ilk, and we really, we're only now starting to have such projects with the, the Arabic literature project that Philip Kennedy is working on, um, the Sheldon Pollock is working on a, on a South Asian series of classical texts, which, whose, first, uh, whose first task is to establish the texts, to establish reliable texts of those, of those works and then translations. Um, so there's very little that's systematic. You know, I had once proposed before there was more Arabic translation, there was only a handful of people working. I proposed to a group to create a union in which you could withhold labor and say, look, we're, you know, the group agrees you're not going to translate this unless publisher X, Y, or Z accepts this list of priorities in which we're going to publish these important books so that there's some sequence. I mean, you have Iraqi poetry and it's a mess. I mean, you have, you know, a few people who are known, there's no relationship to the history of modernist Iraqi poetry. There's no Balund al Haidari, there's no by the Shakir al Sayyab, there's no, the, the, you know, it's a mess. So it's very random and so it allows for a certain kind of sloppiness in terms of. of any kind of literary, cultural, political history to just think can just fall through the cracks very easily and anybody can come along and be the great person of the moment because nobody knows the difference. <laughs> can, I, can I follow up? Can I follow up? Yeah. <laughs> when you were talking about the uh, Iraqi poetry, I was thinking, but isn't that the way Americans consume literature? Well, it's maybe, about consumption. Maybe yeah. not the people in this room, but I was almost thinking of it as the way we have Chinese food one night and yeah. Iraqi food the next night. And we're yeah. not really looking to understand the cuisine over 2,000 years. We're right. just looking for a taste. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Could I possibly come back on? Yeah. Um, might be interesting. 
It is partly random, I guess. But I think there are certain things about which one may speculate. So I think, you know, at the time that Ovid is, I mean, certainly, to some degree, the re um, a translation produces more translations because people are interested, you know. Um, Ovid's being produced in the 80s at a time of change, I think, before the political change. Then you think, well, Dante, if you're a reader in Britain, it comes after the settlement of the Irish Troubles. Um, the beginning of that. Rilke comes at a time when there's a great deal of kind of spiritual hunger, but it's not particularly formalized into uh, religious um, issues. And if you look at Krasnohorka or you look at Seibold, um, both of these cons um, consist to some degree of deferred voices about the sense of history as a sort of recurring um, process and about a certain degree of ap apocalyptism as well. And again, I think these things may tie into certain things, not in a particularly schematic sort of way, but there may be such reasons. Um, it occurs to me that uh, we, are, we are basically talking about canons, um, and I was actually going to ask you, Emil, to speak to the interesting hybrid experience of being an academic and a writer. Um, and uh, I'm thinking about canons all the time in my academic work. I work almost exclusively on completely forgotten underground Soviet poets that nobody currently cares about, but will. Um, and, uh, but uh, one, one thing I wanted to also have asked Semedin about is um, one of these poets who I have translated has, uh, it's been really interesting to watch uh, the reaction to his work among American English poets, poets writing in American English, um, who maybe are consuming him in the Chinese food on Monday night kind of way, uh, but uh, in a way that might actually turn out to be extremely productive for their, for their work because it is a very unexpected voice. And I wonder if, I, I wonder what your relationship is like with American poetry, since you are now also an American poet. You are free now. Okay. I think I influence American poetry. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know what? When I when I published my first book here in, in Japan, uh, I you thought, have, yeah. of course I'm, and I thought you know people will hate. You know, the war, it's, uh, and also it's coming like, you know, now it's news, and because of news, you know, here is a book about this. But in the same time, from the beginning, I know one thing, you know. I, I wrote this book uh, thinking about, uh, you know, four, four, okay? And uh, in a way, at that point in, in time, I thought it's uh, new, you know, and, uh, and if not new, then different, okay? And when things, when, when content coming from a four, okay, uh, you stop think about this non lit, uh, you know, things, element outside of literature, you know. Literature become only important, and I know, you know, 80% people will read Sarajevo Blues because their interest connected with the uh, news, but 20% people will read because of interest for four open in this book. And, uh, and uh, you know, when I said, you know, that I influenced American poetry, I joke a little bit, but you know, let's say 80%, 20% I know that I you know? And uh, in a way, I think I'm a part of this scene. You know? uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I had another speculation, or maybe it's a question. Um, also, maybe from the academic side is, for better or worse, there's this idea of world literature, right? And we're at the Goethe Institute. 
I think that can be done in a superficial way, but can it also be done in a really productive way? I think publishers go, oh, this is hot. It's from someplace interesting. Um, and you know, and they get grabbed in that way. And maybe, again, that can be leveraged in a productive way. I don't actually teach a course on world literature, but I think it's a really interesting question. Um, there was an interesting essay about this topic in N plus one last summer. I don't know if anyone had seen that, so it's actually kind of critical. Um, but yeah, what about world literature here at the Goethe Institute? Any ideas? Yeah, I <laughs> get this idea. But we're good, good. I just uh, we were talking about this uh, in the thing. Yeah, well, okay. I just got a, there's a, a book I would recommend that I just started reading. That's uh, uh, the Wellick Lectures by Ruby Kwantio, and it's called Global Lectics. Uh, globalism <laughs> and dialectics, and he's approaching exactly this question: how, What would be a legitimate world literature, and how would you get to it? It's a very interesting. Um, I think part of the problem is, well, you know, from whose perspective? In other words, would that world liter literature be in Urdu or in, you know, Tagalog or in Kiswahili or in Chinese or in American English? It makes a huge difference, you know? So how would one, you know, how, how from where is it being you know, what's the perspective? So I, I think it, it's a it's a it's a very you know it's a it's a vexed question. Um, I mean, if you're doing it from English, then there are already some presuppositions involved about how it got there and how 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 you know um, how one would think about it. So I don't know. So I think it's to be thought further. You were a young guy talked about world lit literature as a, a something important, you know, like to have a literature, you know, without this language borders. And, and I, I think I understand that, you know, and I mentioned at the beginning similarities in, in our cu cultural background, uh, Amil and me. I didn't talk about language. He was in English, I was in, in Bosnia, okay, he was in Boston, I was in Sarajevo. But we listen to the same music, we, listen, we, we watch the same movies, we, we, we read the same books, okay? And, and because of that, there was, a, you know, some background, cultural background that can be, you know, that because of that background, I, I used to think that, you know, world literature is impossible. But in the meantime, you know, in the last, you know, two decades, I saw how things are changing fast, you know. Uh, how politics can shape differences in a horrible way. You know? Let's say before the war, before the war, I thought oh, it's really possible. But after the war, you know, when you see how um, how one society can stay like century after an another neighbor society just because you know it's destroyed in the three days. You know, you stop think that it's possible to create that continu continuity. I just want to backtrack for a second. And when you talk about you know not that many translations here in America. Um, I publish translations, and I find finally there are some other presses, of course, doing it, but I go into the bookstores, you know, you don't see that many translations, and it's really frustrating. So then I'll go to these other presses and order books that way, because most of my library is translations. I mean, I feel like I live and breathe them, because in America, yes, I can get whatever I want, but I can't from overseas as easily because of lack of translation. And I, I just think of, I've read some of the most wonderful, wonderful things, and I hope that it is changing. It seems like slowly it is that we're seeing more books you know, published. So I just wanted to make that, that comment. Thank you. Hi, I just wanted to ask about that 20% that has to do with form. And if you can talk a little bit about how 
uh, you brought that into English. Yeah, when, when I talk about the, you know that selection, you know how it happened that selection, I thought about literature, okay, real literature, and sometimes there's a you know murky space when we talk about mix of politics and uh, and literature you know in, in your life okay like uh, you know because of politics some books are published okay and when i'm talking about that selection i'm talking about literature you know when you you know you can think about iraqi poets now as a actual because of of uh, a war in iraq but there is, a, you know, amazing Iraqi poets, you know, no matter, you know, what the reason why they are published, published here. That's what I'm talking. And uh, when I said the, this 20%, that this 20% is a literature, you know, that it's only important, you know, reason why it's something published is less important, how important is how this literature resonates with uh, readers, okay? And uh, and if this literature have influence, okay, and that, uh, you know that's the reason why I talk about Chandor Marai, you know, as a you know real writer, unknown for centuries. I think the translating the form is uh, it's a combination of things. I mean, for instance, it's very significant to me, and I know it was to Semesdin, that this Nine Alexanders was a City Lights pocket poet, okay, because that puts it in a certain tradition. Um, and so just putting it in that tradition already does some of the work for you, in a way, okay? It, it's a certain alert, okay, that this book will probably have something to do with the other books that are in, in this particular, very particular format. Um, and in the case of this book, it was very, um, the, the, the formal aspect, I think, that begins in Sarajevo Blues, which is a kind of very succinct, precise reportage that almost sometimes bends towards, you know, a, 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 I would almost say a piece of photographic journalism or a cinematic clip. And the elevation of that in Nine Alexandrias to the seemingly absorbable narrative bits that are actually incredibly uh, torqued syntactically, you know, to extract the highest possible poetic meaning in their, you know, in their circuitry. It's almost like, I mean, if one is a close reader of Dante, you, you see Dante learns how to write in the Inferno. By the time he gets to Canto 26, he's doing things that are completely different than in the earlier cantos. He's, he's able to extend his sentences with many, many different kinds of clauses, many, many different kinds of clauses. And similar things happen here. You have a very particular observation, but the clause gets extended and extended and torqued and pushed further and further and further. It all seems very plain and rep rep reportage-like, but it isn't at all. So it's kind of taken this method and put it in a, in a completely different status. So I don't know if that exactly. Yeah, you're talking about syntactical concerns more than. Say, you're talking about syntactical concerns more than, say, formal. Uh, that's where it metric comes. Or, I mean, that's where it comes out. Yeah. You know, that's where it comes out, and and it has antecedents in certain other poets, a poet like Jack Spicer, I mean, um, the Book of Music, for instance, um, is very much a part of the, you know, the form that goes into this. 
I think we have to close our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you.